Right, I'm going to make a start. It's like being a stand up. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone, and welcome to Camden Arts Centre and to Anthology Live, which is the final, um, I guess, public event um, which has been programmed to accompany um, the exhibitions that I hope you've all seen outside, which are um, Guy Sherman's film in space. Um, this evening is a uh, a sort of experimental live version of the work that's been happening in the central space by Lucy Reynolds, where she's invited, I think it's 17 artists uh, and writers to make films, um, which is something that they might not usually do. And then we've been projecting them in threes in the central space, and they've changed every Monday um, that the show has been on, pretty much. Um, so Lucy, um, for the culmination of the piece, and I guess this is almost a, a, a new thing as well, um, has invited many of the, the people who have made those films to come back and present live versions of um, what they've seen out there or live things relating to their own practice. So um, it's, a, it's an exciting experimental evening. Um, I hope you've all managed to find a, a space to perch. Um, Please bear with us as the evening goes on because there are various different formats and modes that uh, we're going to be presenting work on. So there may be short hiatus um, before in between um, things, but I'm sure it'll be all right. Um, the bar at the back remains open and free, um, so uh, do help yourself to that. Um, I will now hand over to Lucy, who is going to introduce the um, evening as a whole and... Um, tell you what the running order is and all those sorts of things. Could I ask you a couple of things? First of all is to turn off your mobile phones if you haven't already. Some of these works are silent, some of them are contemplative, and it's really annoying when they go off. Furthermore, we are being broadcast, for those of you that um, mind about these things, live on the internet as I speak. Um, so if your phone does go off, it'll ruin everything for posterity forever. Um, so please don't. Um, there will be chances to leave the room um, as the evening goes on, but can I also ask you, if you can possibly help it, not to try and leave through the middle of a performance because some of these um, involve the room being quite dark, especially the first one. So, um, but I will now hand over to Lucy. Thanks, Ben. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, do this event, um, which I hope brings to, I mean, most of the uh, women that I invited to be part of my, I don't know what it is, my collective um, artwork. I'm, I'm not sure quite where the authorship lies in this piece, um, but it's, I just see it as a collective piece where um, 17 women who work um, across both text and image and film um, were prepared to be challenged to produce a 30 second loop or 60 millimeter film. Many of them who work um, in other media or haven't worked with 60 millimeter before. So I think what's so nice about tonight is it's going to show some of the other things that they do. So it's a chance for some, some readings of poetry. Um, it's a chance for um, showing other film works that people have done, um, other writings that people have done and performances. Um, and as you'll see, it's a very varied program. So I'm not really going to say any more than that. We've tried to keep it as informal as we can. I'd hoped to have had this in the cafe just because it would have been more relaxed. But um, at least we have a bar in here. So I just want to feel that we keep it... Um, quite relaxed, and as, I, as um, Ben's already said, there will be um, a little bit of high eight high between performances, because we have quite a lot of different formats that we're working across. So in terms of finding out more about some of the artists showing here, uh, doing a, a performance tonight, um, about, you know, uh, the, the more of information about the pieces that you're going to see tonight, it's perhaps best to ask the artists themselves um, at some point in the evening or afterwards. I'm just simply going to introduce people's names um, and the week in which their loot was shown. And I hope many of you have had a chance to see some of the fantastic um, pieces that they've done over the last eight weeks, nine weeks. Um, so thank you very much for coming. And we're going to begin with um, Annabel Frearson, who showed her loop in week five. And this is a collaborative performance with Ty Shani.
coming soon. He thought he was watching her, but she was watching him. He knew he had gone too far, but he could not stop. He saw exactly what she wanted him to see. Modern master of suspense, witness a mystery, a murder, body double. You cannot believe everything you see. Your face, you're too good looking. It's about men. It's about women. It's about sex. I was pretty drunk last night. Anything happen? No, absolutely nothing. Want to do it again? It's about strategy. You called her twice? Never call abroad more than once a week. Never, ever, ever. It's about... I think maybe you ought to have a drawer over here. A drawer? A whole drawer? It's about friendship. I'm moving in. I give you two months. It's about words. I love you. Who said it first? It's about honesty. Did you sleep with him? I love you. It's about romance. It's about last night. There are seven deadly sins, Captain. You can expect five more of these. You might like to come and take a look at this. In Russia prison, your life story is written on your body. Promises must be made. I accept. And secrets must be kept. It is always good to have someone whom I can trust to do simple tasks. Forget any of this ever happened. Stay away from people like me. You cannot afford to be careless in any area. Do not look at her any more. How did you come in here? There are always open doors. Family is important to you people, is it not? You think I know things that you do not know? I need to know who you are. Show some respect. This is respect. It is like a disease. There is no cure once they have touched you. I want to make him an offer he cannot refuse. This is the business we have chosen. Sometimes the world of the dead mists up with the world of the living. As you can see, the housework has been rather neglected since the servants disappeared almost a week ago. Do you mean they just vanished? Into thin air. How do you do, children? I am your new man. Are you going to leave us too? Why should I leave you? The others said they would not. They did. And then it happened. Why have you opened the curtain? It was Victor. You told your brother that there was someone else in the room? There was. That will do, Anne. I have seen them too. You have? Sooner or later, she will see them. And then everything will be different. What do you... Help! They're everywhere! They say this house is theirs! No! Children! Come here! Run! Can you not hear it? There's someone there! Where is my daughter? Are you mad? I am your daughter. One storm changed the face of our planet. It will happen again. 
Phraseology is at a loss to explain what has caused this weather. Baffled by the largest hailstorm on record, there is snow in India. The ocean rose by 25. What you see, there are walls of water coming towards New York City. Where will you be? The day after tomorrow. You're gonna need a bigger boat. You know the accident out there? Yeah. That lady, she broke her neck. Oh my God, where is she? Standing next to my window. You have a secret, but you do not want to tell me. I see dead people walking around like regular people. I do not see anything. Make sure they are there. They are everywhere. They want me to do things for them. I think that they know you are one of these very rare people who can see them. So you need to help them. I do not think that is the way it works. Not every gift is a blessing. Please, make them leave. I am working on it. I am sick and tired of going to the funeral of black men who have been murdered by white men. They are powerless against us if every single Anglo-Saxon Christian, one of us, stand together. The rest of America do not see it that way, Mr. Mayor. You had us scared to death, man. Do not call me man, boy. Did it ever occur to them they are going to end up dead? We are here to protect. When America was at war with itself. Bringing her down in five, four, three, two, one. Prometheus has landed. Good morning, on with the show. These are images all over the earth, ancient, shared, no, yet same, every last one. It is a map. No, not a mapping invitation. From whom? Let us say you do find these beings down there. You will not engage them. You will not talk to them. You will do nothing but report back to me. How far would you go for get your answer? Look at this. One of them picked up a life form. Are you seeing this? They went searching for our beginning. What is that? You need to stay calm. Everybody back on the ship now. What they discovered could be our end this year. If you are going down there, you are going to die. Changing? Changing into what? What is that? That is a ship. They are leaving. To go where? Earth. We were so wrong. Take us home. If we do not stop it, there will not be any home to go back to. There is a, here, cut it out, let it out of me, loud scream. Coming soon.
Is that the right height for you? Yeah, I think I've set it before, actually. No, it's a bit high. I might take it down a bit. It's all right, I'll do it. Is that live? You just oh. turned it off. Is it uh, that easy to flick actually, off? maybe I had that one on. Is it on now? Yeah. I took yeah, that it's one on now, but okay. you can use the other one. If that one's maybe a little bit louder. Right? Maybe that's the one I had, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I've taken the wrong one. Thanks. That's it. That's the one I had before. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. And then I'll line it up. I'll just switch it on and then we hopefully do you want to line yeah, it up a bit? I'll get it lined up. Where's my student gone? She's just over there. Oh, yes. Yeah, looking busy. Um, did you want me to. Should we take a Okay, everyone. Next, we have Sharon Morris, who showed her loop in week four. Gospel Oak. The view from Parliament Hill. Paddington Basin, Carmine, Monsoon, Battleship, Cucumber. Battersea's vision of a green bird. Lambeth's three sisters, constant revolutionising of production. City of London, walkie-talkie, pint, helter-skelter, pinnacle. Heron Tower, cheese grater, Tower 42, gherkin. Uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions. Shadowing St. Paul's, the stealth bomber, vortex. Rothschild Sky Pavilion, groundscaper engine block for UBS. Everlasting uncertainty and agitation. South of the river, Shard, Quill, Strata, Razor, Isengard, Boomerang, Dune Street, Tower. All fixed, fast-frozen relations are swept away. Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf, Tower 42, Riverside South, One Canada Square, the FSA, the Pride. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. Art is not a mirror. Art is a hammer. Don't you hear we're at war? Don't we fear you're at war? Don't you believe we're at war? Don't we grieve you're at war? Aren't you flooded by war? Aren't you blooded in war? Aren't we maimed by war? Aren't we to blame you're at war? 
Don't you drown in war? Don't we own this war? Haven't we earned this war? Aren't you burned by war? Don't you dream we're at war? Aren't you damned we're at war? Aren't we drummers of war? Trotsky. Art, it is said, is not a mirror but a hammer. It does not reflect its shapes. But at present, even the handling of a mirror is taught with the help of a hammer. The depository of winter. Obliterating all difference that last ice age 20,000 years ago. Shrinking the sea, sinking the land. Then the great thaw, splitting white into the full spectrum of color, the diversity of things. A northward drift of the tree line, at first coniferous, then deciduous. Small wild flowers in the tundra. Brown bear and caribou followed by deer, boar by wild pig. The migration of Mesolithic people walking from Europe. Before the island flood, the land still rising, tilting, but more slowly than the sea. And my dream recurs, a trough in the ocean, a depression in the water. Terrible steed, you hanging on the tree of the world, linking hell to sky. Where are the wolves and eagles to warn of fire? Cut off your ears so that you may hear the growth of forest, leaf and flower, rustling small creatures, the swan drinking. Take an axe to the oak to find its root, deru, doru, dru, meaning truth. Send out your soul on horseback to those places torn by war. Bear a poultice of mud to heal our wounds inflicted by those monstrous acts only the hawk sees. What cannot be forgotten? Before maps, rivers and streams, holy wells, bridges, stiles, stones and great trees mark the edge of our world. Village rites of birth and death beaten into the body. An annual procession walked the bounds of Gospel Oak, down the watershed of West Meadow, Saxon Ditch and River Fleet to Haverstock Hill. Boys were whipped with willow until they cried, bumped on stones and dunked in water, stopped under the Gospel Oak for the blessing of crops, women holding knots of wild flowers. Living my life backwards, there were days when I would sit on a bus to the end of the line. I was lost, and it was something to do. It cost only a single fare, starting in Victoria on the 29, ending up at Wood Green. I wanted wood. I wanted green. To the source, source, surdre to rise, sagera, walk with me. Follow the green through the dry oaten grass, the green of nettles, thistles, clover, sorrel, the dampness where condensation rolls over the dip and swell of the land, rinsing through backshot sand and layers of flint, funneled into the welt of Cayley Beat leaching horizontally over thin clay beds to spring from the navel as that will spring, run off tethered into rills and rivulets, rivers, ray wall, ray, trickling through the puddled ponds of cay and wood, sinking as that deep surge cold as hell into the lake of guilt, pulling under Parliament Hill, the eastern stream, strauma, strom, ström, through willing its confluence with the western branch hulled from the veil of health. This tranquil pond so still and painful, a perfect circle of water lilies imperceptible, its drift idling through the dense underlay of horsetail, reed, bulrush and sphagnum moss, the ooze picking up momentum into the hollow stream, Olburn, Holburner, Hoburn, whittling southeast, becoming the river fleet, Fleerton, Fleot, Flot, Flood, at Angler's Lane, 
Cambridge Town, Kendidge Town, anchor of the Thames at its tidal reach. Every day, Bruce passes by with his daughter's Rhodesian ridgeback. No contrails, the sky in absolute volcanic blue sparkles. Joy is giving a singing lesson while her Burmese cat wails outside. If I were to leave home without a watch, a tiding of magpies picks through dirt, tossing new slain grass. Jill often used to read here on a bench by the tumulus. I never walk over Hampstead Heath without seeing the kestrel. From behind the hedge, a trumpet sounds an arpeggio suddenly. Saturday morning outside the Dario Cafe drinking coffee, a green woodpecker flies low out of the grass. Under the awning of the bandstand, a man performing Tai Chi slows time. We pull back the ivy and pass between the wings of the pond. Kappa diem, Anne tells me. Constable the Nubilus skying. View from Hampstead Heath looking towards Harrow, August 1821, 5 p.m., very fine, bright, and wind after rain slightly in the morning. Study of clouds at Hampstead, 11th September 1821, RA 10 to 11. Morning under the sun, clouds silvery gray on warm ground, sultry. Light wind to the southwest, fine all day, but rain in the night following. The road to the Spaniards, Hampstead, July 1822, looking northeast, 3 p.m., previous to a thunder squall, wind northwest. Cloud study, August 27th, 1822, at 11 a.m., o'clock, noon, looking eastward, large silvery clouds, wind gentle at southwest. London from Hampstead with a double rainbow, 1831, between 6 and 7 o'clock, evening, June. This, the first diagram of a double rainbow, shows the precise angles of primary and secondary bow, its spectrum inverted, noting that the height depends upon time of day and year, and that a rainbow cannot be seen obliquely, as a viewer must always keep the sun over the shoulder, a mild arch of promise, flashing brief splendor through the clouds a while. What do we want? It's an ancient cry, like a hunting horn, this voice of the demo, vox populi of the 99%. St. Paul's demarcated from the square mile. Cecina Paola capitalism, written on hazard tape. It's the fall we want, the fall of inequity, to shut down what Keynes called the casino, the market's roulette, playing dice with our lives. For the oak, heartfelt, flight of heart, wild at heart, heart willed, heart worn, heart of iron, in good heart, heart of the dog, heartache, take my heart, heart of cherry, heart of cheer, learn by heart, kernel of the heart, heartland, lender's heart, lose heart, heartless, heart leaf. Heart of life, stolen heart, heart of steel, in bad heart, heart of the bud, faint of heart, find the heart, light-hearted, heart of the lute, heart's ease, easy in heart, heart strings, strong of heart, heart wood, wooden heart, broken heart, heart of the brook, heavy heart, heart of heaven, Oracle heart, heart of oak. Boo boo, boo boo. Imagine when Eurasian eagle owls, the largest owls in the world, 
flew free over Hampstead Heath. I've only ever seen them in a cage at Golders Hill Zoo, one always asleep, the other to the fore wide awake. Only when the dusk starts to fall does the owl of Minerva spread its wings and fly. How we understand history in Hegel's view with the hindsight of a new age. The owl seeking its prey on the wing swerves into the dark unknown. Apple Gatherers by Stanley Spencer, 1912 to 1913. Painted over a first rendition of the resurrection. A surplus of apples, green, symmetrical, bramley, russet and cox, occasionally split, skins revealing juicy flesh. And this is what I wish for you, the din of happiness all around me everywhere. After all the labor and care, sweet fragrance of apple blossom amidst pale curled leaves and the harvest yet to come. Thank you. Closer, closer.
Um, so next up, we have Helen Martin, um, who uh, showed her loop in week four. And this is a collaborative performance that she's doing with Claire McClough Carter. Last Monday, Claire McClough Carter and Helen Martin contact me requesting I introduce this performance. In exchange for this introduction, Claire and Helen promised to obtain me a ticket for this event as it was previously ticketed and sold out. I had expected payment. No money was offered. Claire and Helen also asked me to introduce Abdul Qadir, who has agreed to demonstrate cat chewing. Abdul Qadir has not shown up. Understandably, perhaps. Although cat is the only drug not prohibited by the Quran, some cat chewers are shy of being identified. The location of a cat house, or malfrish, as it is known, is closely guarded by users. Women and Westerners are not usually welcome. An estimated 10 million people globally use cat on a daily basis. Cat is a stimulant grown and consumed in parts of Northeast Africa and the Middle East, where cat chewing has a long history as a social custom dating back thousands of years. <coughs> it is imported into the UK at an estimated 10 tons a week to meet demand among predominantly Ethiopian, Kenyan, Somali, Yemeni and immigrant communities. It is prohibited in many countries including the USA and several within the EU. It remains unrestricted in the UK. On the 23rd of January, 2013, the UK Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, ACMD, stated there was insufficient evidence that cat caused health problems, and there was no evidence cat was directly linked with serious or organized crime, social problems, or terrorist groups. It was chewed to obtain a mild stimulant effect much less potent than stimulant drugs, such as amphetamines. Reported social problems associated with cat remain a concern among the UK's immigrant Somali community. In a report for the Home Office, David M. Anderson and Neil C. M. Carrier, University of Oxford, found that beyond often contradictory anecdotal statements, no evidence was found to show a causal relationship between cat and the various perceived social harms, such as laziness and unemployment, for which cat's consumption is supposedly responsible. As well as cat, many other variables might contribute to the social problems confronting the relevant communities, i.e. the effects of civil war, displacement, complex gender relations, and problems of integration. I suggested to Claire and Helen that I could demonstrate the catching myself for a fee of 60 pounds. However, they argued adamantly that if I was not already a catcher, it would be unethical to be paid to learn the technique. They did suggest, however, that 
If I found a volunteer to demonstrate, they'd be willing to pay me a £60 finder's fee. Claire and Helen often reject the complacent, complacency of shared experience, bringing labour relations to the forefront is a point of contention. So if anyone would like to participate in this alternative economic venture of herbal stimulants, please do come forward. Claire and Helen also inform me they view non-participation as a form of participation. Anyone? No? Oh. Okay. Well, uh, let me get you some chat. How do I get this? How to chew cat in 21 steps. Before I read the instructions, I've been told to let you know that cat has a bitter taste, so it is usually accompanied with sweet tea or fizzy drinks. 1. Buy a cup of sweet tea or a can of fizzy drink. 2. Pick a bundle of leaves, choosing the succulent-looking ones. Three, pay for your cat. Four, <laughs> strip a few tender leaves from the bundle and place in mouth. Five, begin chewing. Six, taste the bitterness. <laughs> Seven, Feel your mouth filling with saliva. Eight, do not swallow the leaves. It is not dangerous but will limit the effects. Nine, absorb the juices. Ten, store the mashed up wad of leaves in your cheek and take a sip of sweet drink. Eleven, chew the leaves more to make soft. Twelve, taste the bitterness. Thirteen, feel your mouth filling with saliva. Fourteen, do not swallow the mashed up plant. Fifteen, absorb the juices. Sixteen, send the wad of leaves to your cheek. Seventeen, Take a gulp of sweet drink. Eighteen, chew some more. Nineteen, if you wish to talk to someone, stash the wad in your cheek. Twenty, if you wish to refresh, spit the wad into the bucket. Twenty-one, wipe mouth with tissue and continue conversations. Can I have some drink? Yes. <laughs> Repeat the process. Before I read the instructions, I have been told to let you know that cat has a bitter taste, so it is usually accompanied with drinking sweet tea or fizzy drinks. 1. Buy a cup of sweet tea or a fizzy drink. 2. Pick up
Pick a bundle of leaves, choosing the freshest looking ones. <laughs> Three, peer for your cat. Four, if you choose tea, wait two minutes for it to cool down. Three, strip a few tender, sorry, five, strip a few tender leaves from the bundle and place in mouth. Six, begin chewing. Seven, taste the bitterness. Eight, feel your mouth filling with saliva. Nine, do not swallow the leaves. Ten, absorb the juices. Eleven, store the mashed up white of leaves in your cheek and take a sip of sweet drink. Chew the leaves more to make soft. Thirteen, feel the bitterness. Fourteen, feel your mouth filling with saliva. Fifteen, do not swallow the mashed up plant. Sixteen, absorb the juices. Seventeen, send the wad to your cheek. Eighteen, take a gulp of sweet drink. Nineteen, chew some more. Twenty, if you wish to talk to someone, stash the wad in your cheek. Twenty-one, keep tearing strips off the tender stalks with your teeth and chew. Twenty-two, if you wish to refresh, spit the wad into the bucket. Twenty-three, wipe mouth with tissue and continue conversations. Repeat the process. Well, drug taking at the Camden Arts Centre. Who'd have thought it? Um, next up, we have uh, Cherry Smith, um, who also showed, in fact, um, the, she showed in week four as well as Helen and Sharon. So you imagine them all showing their loops in the space out there. So, um, Cherry, over to you. Thank you, Lucy, and uh, thank you for putting together a really ambitious and interesting anthology of women who've been involved with making or writing about film for years. Um, I'm more poetry in space than film in space. Whenever I miss the sea or I miss sea air or I miss space, I think of all the back gardens of London being like streets of oxygen, green streets. Back to back. Can you hear at the back? Yes. This cinema that needs no darkness, spooling bloom overnight, overfed pink heads bunch and brag on branches, 
perfume loose and bareback rides in from the gardens back to back. Petals zoom from buds mouthing May. Color red, color yellow, color techni, disregarding fences. This next poem was written after suffering Il Deserto Rosso by Antonioni, a 1964 movie in which he actually painted the grass and the trees white to get the film, film feeling of bleak industrial wasteland. Il Deserto Rosso. Red gantries stalk the Ravenna docks, a sea architecture to deliver dreams. Do you see her trying to escape? Do you take passengers? Hanjin juggernauts emerge from fog. Edge to edge, their iron bodies line rough decks in washed sienna. Each ship a building afloat with crates that should sink it. She could have climbed in different shoes. Great arcing claws rush their bent R's in and out of the earth, its grass and trees turn white. Everything on land is solid with disappointment, a language that burns and moves. It exhales noisily, like something criminal she has done. She pays a worker for his sandwich, eats as if she's homeless. The factory hums, the streets are empty. Smoke makes itself a black sky. The management are calm, civilly dressed. She runs from the edge of the pier, a fast road through water, her green coat living to be this dislodged. Not even love or sex can pin her down, though some find it appealing in the beach hut, try to take her wharf side. It seldom helps. That was the director's best decision, to leave her helpless. And the last one I want to read is, is a long prose poem in um, eight parts, and it's dedicated to a filmmaker who can't be here tonight. Uh, she's not well. It'll call Jackie Duckworth, who made homemade melodrama, Invitation to Marilyn C, and Prayer Before Birth, as well as lots of other short experimental dyke films in the 80s. Um, it's called Rushes. One. That you could handle film was like touching God. That you could lift a spool in your white cotton fingers from its can, from the tower of cans and thread it onto the steenbeck was like showing how God moves. I watched you in the dark make thousands of tiny decisions of light. To. From spool to empty spool, the images clattered a baggy ribbon of blurred flickers that you paused, lifting the hood and lining the strip with china marker. You pulled the film out of the gate towards you like two elastic arms and settled it on the metal cutting block. You spliced and taped and fed the scene back a minute shorter. You numbered the end, fast fastened it to a bull clip and hung it on a hook on the wall or slid it into a suspended cloth bag for trims. Then you clicked down the hood and made the movie move again. Three. We'd flirted at a feminist film group. I'd noticed your walk, a loping swagger on long legs and tight jeans, the static between us made me giggle so much I had to leave the room. You didn't want a relationship. 
I made you have one. You'd sit at the edge of your seat. You couldn't hear anything else when you were editing. The images were sound that needed an exact rhythm, a melody only you could detect. You knew to cut just before it seemed to need it, your attention surgical. Thelma Schoenmacher sat at your right shoulder. When we watched La Règle de Jeu, I didn't flinch as a dozen rabbits and birds were shot. You taught me to go inside the cuts, 102 in four minutes, counting Renoir's rhythm, defined by Marguerite Hulet, his editor and lover at the time. Four. We met in unadorned rooms in Soho, in basements or at the end of a grey corridor where daylight never arrived. The sun burnt a a bar of gold on the ceiling or the wall where the blackout curtain didn't quite close. In these dark and smoky places, you showed me what made you, making sense of every film I'd ever liked, teaching me why, giving my passion a possible world. We never had sex there. You were paying by the hour. Five. Film buffs were men with beards and B.O. We were cinema fiends. There were no videos or DVDs. There was the ceremony of cinema. A Von Trotter double bill at the Academy, a Bergman triple at the Electric, Midnight Cults at the Scala, Monday nights at the Everyman. We travelled, stayed awake, skived off work because there were films to be seen. I'd smuggle in a bowl of finely chopped, dressed salad, fresh bagels and two forks, and we'd sit silently nourishing ourselves for hours. You never stood up until the last credit, as if by reading each name, honouring each member of the crew, you could absorb their skill, their magic. Six. You were in love with many women. You appreciated them like a connoisseur of fine liqueurs with a longing roll of the eyes and a small gasp. Gina Rowlands in Woman Under the Influence, Bernadette Lafont in La Fiancée du Pirate, Giulietta Massina in Knights of Cabiria, Sophia Loren and Catherine Deneuve in Anything. You were a big flirt and a big fan And I didn't realize then how much humility and forgiveness that required. You forgave Deneuve her bad plots and her love affairs with ugly men. You forgave me, my younger women. You were capable of devotion. You knew the difference a twenty-fifth of a second could make to a glance across a crowded bar. Seven. You were a celluloid master. I bowed at your feet. Once you rescued a bored porn star from another bad movie, devising a way she could cut herself free from the film strip and escape on the back of your motorbike. No one believed it would work. Or the 16 millimeter feature you made of the threesome you were living in in a flat in Warren Street in the early 80s. You ate only toast and tepid tea. But women always fed you more. Eight. You gave me a Super 8 to take to Russia, showed me how to use it. I carried it like a baby. I shot blossoms falling in a Moscow park, a gigantic mural on the dull outskirts, a sudden heap of tomatoes for sale on the roadside. I couldn't film people. The camera was a gun I couldn't point. I couldn't see a hole from parts, came home with short, unfinished poems. I don't know where that footage is. In a grey can somewhere, hell closed with white tape with my name on it, and a dusty shelf in some cutting room.
Thank you. Thanks. Next, um, we have a film by Amy Clark, who showed her loop in week number two.
So I'm going to keep the lights down. Next, we have um, Sarah Tripp, who showed in, well, I can't read what week from my notes here, <laughs> but um, I think, I don't know if Sarah can remember, but certainly she, she showed, I think it's week five. I'm not sure, or week three. Anyway, um, Sarah's going to now um, do, uh, show some films and do a performance for us.
the sound is still there. I listen carefully to the stranger. She wants directions to the bus stop and a pound for the bus. The pierced hole in her right ear has ripped and healed into a pointless flap. In her left ear hangs a hooped earring, looped together with its spare partner for safekeeping. I point left to the bus stop. She studies my face and walks up to the right. I point left to the bus stop. She studies my face and walks off to the right. I point left to the bus stop, she studies my empty hands, and walks off to the right. I'm talking to him when I notice the second hole in his left ear. He's attractive and talking to him is a pleasure and his ears are perfectly invisible to me until I notice. The visible part of his ear, the oracle, is a normal fluted funnel narrowing to a canal. But beneath that, another hole also ends in darkness. My words enter into him through the first hole. He replies with a smile that suggests he comprehends but doesn't necessarily agree. Whatever he hears through the second hole is additional to what other people hear and in addition to what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> His stutter is a response to the extreme violence of the assault. His quiet masculinity and the form of the assault, the pursuit of money, makes me angry. He says he feels no anger and that in many respects the assault was the best thing that ever happened to him. This is beyond my comprehension. His explanation is plain enough. The assault took him to a place of extreme submission where his own death felt more than likely and now he feels very little. And the intimacy of the assault, the close, intense, physical intimacy of it is somehow defining. One word is unclear. You isolate and repeat the word. I still don't understand. You say the word directly at me. And for a moment, the sheer force of your facial expression makes an impression of certainty on me. I say the word back, but it's wrong. The responsibility for the misunderstanding shifts onto me. You enunciate the word slowly, boring a hole with each syllable. There is a suggestion of idiocy. <laughs> Something repels us. We cannot do this simple thing. The word is stuck between us. The sounds are loud and clear but they remain abstract. All goodwill is lost. I'm standing with a stranger, looking at a painting in an art gallery. I'm trying to decipher 
what the paintings are, and his thoughts are unknown to me. The painting has trapped us here together in a prolonged silence of uncertainty. Thank you, Sarah. And that was shown in week three. Uh, next, Audrey Reynolds, who was showing in the first week of the show. Later this evening, or tomorrow morning, I want to show you something very special. It's beautifully woven. It has happened twice. I am like Fernando's daughter. And now this lure will be with me for weeks. He roared in my ear as I looked at the drawing of a lion. No one else can hear the sounds. I wait for them. When they come, I stop what I'm doing. I listen carefully, trying to work out exactly where they are coming from. I give you, Catherine. Sing away, Catherine. Owls and dreams. Okay, Owls and we're going to be dreams. talking about archetypes. Okay, we're going to be talking about archetypes. And things I'm not too concerned with. And things I'm not too I started concerned writing with. because of a terrible fear. I started writing because of a terrible fear. I felt it was drifting and obscure when I rebelled against that. I felt it was drifting and obscure when I rebelled against that. That first draft was actually quite that good. That first draft because was actually quite good. Because it actually tried to do it. Was natural. Because it was funny. It was natural. It was natural. It was not funny. Take it for granted that life exists more fully in what is commonly thought big than in what is commonly thought small. This procedure is an attempt to reach clarity in a region where clarity is not possible. It confuses them with one another, allowing the outside in, making the inside out, dividing them and joining them. Others may claim that given this, they are still bored, trying her best not to cry, waiting for the other girls on a bench with a pain in her leg. I turned her upside down, made her turn, like Julia. Very often no one is in charge of the white space. One notices a milieu less when one is plunged in it, more so when it is rather briskly altered or when one leaves it, spirals away from it, is drawn into it, ultimately separates from it. The following are real questions. These matters are not just given. For example, ignoring the Mona Lisa, Kafka, Writing, closing my eyes. The underplinth lacks a century, but the suggestion that home is a kind of space is grounded on an understanding of space that is autonomous, independent of its human subjects. Up to what point is such and such a development indispensable to the interest? What is the point beyond which it ceases to be rigorously so? Where, for the complete expression of one subject, does a particular relation stop, giving way to some other not concerned in that expression? I'm noticing an erotic drift. Maybe we need to strengthen this. Each inescapably shapes the character of the other. Nothing shall have taken place but the place. 
The works of the mind would be spared blackmail by the frailty of paper. They would rest upon nothing and be free from the obligations of place. I wouldn't have dreamed of touching it. He restores it to hearing. He lends his voice to it. I think I'd have to see a man, just for the distance. Very stark and analytical. Tell me about the sky. So next, um, we have a film by Clooney Reed who showed her loop in week two.
So, um, in week five, we had Lizzie Hughes showing her loop, and she's going to do a reading and show a film for us now. So when I was a student, I had two great passions, the writing of Gertrude Stein and designing for the theatre. Gertrude Stein was tolerated and even encouraged, but although it was never explicitly stated, I was reasonably sure that working in the theatre wasn't. The misplaced desire to be a good student um, got the better of me, and I put aside plans to um, put on a production of one of her plays. I still have a lot of time for Stein, but it's only on the rarest of occasions that I set foot in a theatre. Still, the time I spent making sets and making costumes has served me well, and I can often be found making household objects, and in particular, dressmaking. However, whilst on the one hand I find sewing relaxing and peaceful, on the other, I often find myself racked with guilt at the terrible indulgence. It's because I'm all too aware that whilst I'm making, I'm not working. That is, I'm working, but I'm not making art. Now, about this time last year, I went to a conference on art and psychoanalysis, where one of the speakers, Sharon Kivland, spoke about the mental and physical process of making a pink silk bustle. At the end of the lecture, she took the bustle in question out of a box and deftly tied it around her waist. And just a few days ago, I heard that most of the people in the lecture theatre were either admiring her needlework skills or spellbound by the erotic charms of the object. I didn't get that far. I was just profoundly jealous that she seemed to have found a legitimate way to bring her needlework, if not into the gallery, then at least into a lecture hall. When Lucy asked me if I'd like to prepare something for tonight, I said that I would, and then immediately went into panic, because performance has never really been my thing, and I drew a blank about what I was going to do. And then, one evening whilst I was knitting and avoiding any real work, I remembered about Counting Her Dresses, a play by Gertrude Stein. When they did not see me, I saw them again. I did not like it. I count her dresses again. Can you draw a dress? In a minute. Believe in your mistake, act quickly, do not mind the tooth, do not be careless. I am careful, yes you are, and obedient, yes you are, and industrious, certainly. Come to sing and sit. Repeat it. I repeat it. Can you speak quickly? Can you cough? Remember me to him. Remember that I want a cloak. I know what I want to say. How do you do? I forgive you everything, and there is nothing to forgive. The dog, you mean pale. No, we want dark brown. I'm tired of blue. Shall I wear my blue? Do. Thank you for the cow. Thank you for the cow. Thank you very much. Collecting her dresses. Shall you be annoyed? Not at all.
Can you be thankful for what? For me. I do not like this table. I can understand that. A feather. It weighs more than a feather. It is not tiring to count dresses. What is your belief? In exchange for a table, in exchange for or on a table, we were satisfied. Can you say you like Negro sculpture? The meaning of windows is air, and a door, a door should be closed. Can you manage it? You mean dresses? Do I mean dresses? I mean one, two, three. Can you spell quickly? I can spell very quickly. So can my sister-in-law, can she? Have you any way of sitting? You mean comfortably? Naturally. I understand you. Are you afraid? I'm not any more afraid of water than they are. Do not be insolent. We need clothes and wool and gloves and waterproofs. Can you laugh at me and then say, married? Yes. Do you remember how he looked at clothes? Do you remember what he said about wishing? Do you remember all about it? Oh yes, you are stimulated and amused. We are. What can I say that I'm fond of? I can see plenty of instances. Can you? For that, we will make an arrangement. You mean some drawings. I do not talk of art. All numbers are beautiful to me. Of course they are. Thursday? We hope for Thursday. So do we. Was she angry? Whom do you mean was she angry? Was she angry with you? Reflect more. I do not want a garden. Do you? And clothes. I do not mention clothes. No, you didn't, but I do. Yes, I know that. He is tiring. He's not tiring. No, indeed. I can count them. You do not misunderstand me. I misunderstand no one. Can you explain my wishes in the morning to me? Yes, in there. Then you do not explain. I do not press for an answer. Can you expect her today? We saw a dress. We saw a man. Sarcasm. We can be proud of tomorrow. And the vests and the doors. 
I always remember the roads. Can you speak English in London and here with me? Account her dresses, collect her dresses, clean her dresses, have the system. She polished the table, count her dresses again. When can you come? When can you come? Breathe for me. I can say that it isn't funny in the meantime. Can you say what? We have been told. Oh, read that. I do not understand this homecoming in the evening, naturally. We have decided, indeed, if you wish. Thank you, Lizzie. And by coincidence, our um, next performer is Sharon Keeveland, who showed her loop in week number five. like Mel Brooks, you know, with one of these. <laughs> I have to wait till the images come up. I'm just improvising. It's like history, isn't it? One fucking thing after another. <laughs> it's, it, and it's called Anna and Sigmund. Bit of a clue there. It's got my name on it as well. It's got the date. They might be more interesting. We're in. Right, Anna and Sigmund. Next slide. Right, as so often when I'm invited to speak, I show this photograph. Look, it's a photograph of my father and me on holiday. No, of course it isn't. Next slide. <laughs> Do I look like I'd wear a dirndl? <laughs> Willingly. Well, when I was a small child. Next slide. Well, look, look, of course, it really isn't a picture of, uh, of my father and me on holiday, but here is a picture of my father and me on holiday. It was taken in Athens in 1967. But there are others in the photograph, my mother, my sister, another woman who may be a family friend, and I'm seized with the sentiment of sibling rivalry <laughs> and a more complex feeling of competition uh, for possession with other women, all women, sisters, mothers, and friends of the family. Next slide. Here's a photograph of my father and me on holiday, the others eliminated. 
I have my father to myself for once, and that's certainly one way of resolving conflict. Uh, conflict. Next slide. And you can just go through these next slides at a gentle pace, using your own natural rhythm. <laughs> Freud imagines in civilization and its discontents that the unconscious is like Rome, a cyclic entity in which nothing that has once come into existence will have passed away, and all the earlier phases of development continue to exist along the latest ones. When you come to the end of the black and white ones, you'll find a picture, uh, I can't remember what it is, but I might have to shout at you to stop. He suggests that the same pace, space can't have two different contents, uh, however, that one must be done away with to allow another to content, content to enter, like metaphor, that in substitution, what Freud calls condensation, there is both manifest and latent discourse. Now, Freud dreams of Rome four times, and his dreams are those of longing, until he discovers it needs only a little courage to fulfill his wish, as he adds in a footnote of 1909. In another note, 16 years later, he appears delighted to add that after 1909, he became a constant pilgrim to Rome. In October 1898, he writes to his friend Wilhelm Fleece. So I'm just waiting. Stop. Don't change the slides after this. Of his lassitude, moderated only by his study of the topography of Rome the yearning for which becomes ever more tormenting. His dream book lies still, and a conclusion evades him. He's lonely. In his first dream, Freud is looking out of a railway carriage at the Ponte Sant'Anglo and the Tiber when suddenly the train moves off and he realises he has not so much as set foot in the city. The view he has of Rome, glimpsed so briefly before the train takes him away, is derived from an engraving, seen only for a moment in the sitting room of a patient the previous day. A scene breaks off in the dream, as all dreamers know, or Freud breaks off in his telling of the dream, for he will only allow so much narrative detail to escape. In his second dream, Freud sees Rome from afar, shrouded in mist. Rome is so far away, he is surprised at the clarity of the view. The first town he saw this way, shrouded in mist, was Lübeck, and the top of the hill was at Gleichenberg, near Graz, the oldest and most important summer spa in South Styria, and I've taken out the rest of the Styrian section here, which was a bit long. It is, he remarks, a matter of chance whether one discovers the source of particular elements of dream, thinking of the image of a church tower he recognised in a small station. I've taken out now the station stuff. Again, he stops, as he does so frequently, in recounting his dreams, saying there is more in a dream's contents than he's prepared to detail. However, he allows there is something of the promised land seen from afar. In his third dream... Freud at last gets to Rome. Uh, he arrives in Rome, but is disappointed to find the scenery is not what he expected. Actually, what he sees is a narrow stream of dark water, on one side of which are dark cliffs, on the other a meadow with large white flowers. He asks a Herr Zucker, a man he notices, whom he knows a little, to show him the way to the city. He says he is trying to see in his dream the city he's never seen in his waking life. And I've just eliminated a large section on Carlsbad. In the fourth dream, occurring shortly after the last, Freud is surprised to see so many posters in German stuck up in Rome. To Fleece, he writes of his surprise at this. He writes that only a few days before, he sent a letter to a friend uh, in which he suggests Prague might be, not be an agreeable place for a German to walk about in. To Fleece, he writes that he awoke and immediately thought, so this is Prague, where such German signs, as is well known, are called for. He thinks his dream expresses the wish that he meet his friend in Rome rather than in Prague, where people might be disagreeable to them when they hear them speak German. He writes, my longing for Rome is, by the way, deeply neurotic, and I've eliminated a large section on neurosis and children in Czech nurseries. At last, Freud goes to Rome, 
An event he calls the high point of his life. He enters Rome with his brother Alexander on the 2nd of September, 1913, on the first of seven visits. It seems incomprehensible to him that he has not achieved this until now, the fulfillment of a long-cherished wish. On the 13th of September, 1913, next slide, please, Freud sends a postcard uh, from Rome to his daughter, Anna. He writes simply, Papa, to his future companion. On the 2nd of September, 22nd of September, he sends her another postcard, a view of the waterfalls in Tivoli, writing, in order to convince you. In 1913, Anna is bursting with jealousy of her sister Sophie, who's just married Max Halberstadt. It's then that Freud's incomprehension towards the sexual orientation of his youngest daughter begins, and he makes allusions to her bad habits. She writes that she herself does not want these to overcome her. Freud calls her his only daughter and is convinced she has transferred her rivalry of Sophie to a jealousy with regard to her husband, and he exhorts Anna not to be frightened of men. No, what he says is rather she should not be afraid of being desired by men. The following year, when she's welcomed by Ernest Jones in London, Freud writes to Jones that Anna does not ask to be treated as a woman, being still distanced from her sexual desires and quite refusing men. She do, he does not see that his daughter is not attracted by Jones, who, by the way, is a dreadful womanizer, but I've eliminated a large section <laughs> on Jones's seduction, <laughs> but rather by his companion, Loic Khan, of whom she dreams. In 1923, Freud is halfway through the second part of his psychoanalysis of Anna. It's taken in two stages over four years. In a letter to Lou Andreas Salome, he's obliged to admit that Anna's libido has awakened and her object choice has simply nothing to do with men. In 1923, after the death of Sophie's seven, second son, Heinz, and the diagnosis of the cancer of the jaw that will end her father's life 16 years later, Anna officially renounces marriage. Her father calls her his Antigone and buys her a dog an Alsatian called Wolf, or Wolfie. To Lou, Freud confides his dismay. He fears that Anna's genitality will play a trick on her, and he confesses that he is not able to separate her from him, nor himself from her. On Anna's part, she feels her attraction to women arriving once again and confides in Lou herself. She dreams a dream with a woman protagonist, and it's a story of love which she cannot cease to think. She's tempted at once to write to her father about it, but decides to let it drop in order to, con to concentrate on a paper she's writing. The paper, Beating Fantasies and Daydreams, encompasses the dream. It's about a paper about beating in young children and follows the famous paper of her father's, A Child is Being Beaten, of 1919, in which the fantasies recounted by a little girl resemble strongly those of his daughter, he describes the daydream of a girl of about 15 whose fantasy life, in spite of its abundance, has never come into conflict with reality. The origin, evolution, and termination of this daydream could be established with certainty, and its derivation from dependence on a beating fantasy of long standing were proved in a rather thoroughgoing analysis. In her own paper, Anna analyzes fantasies as though they are not her own, explaining that the dreamer has substituted a lovely story in place of the memory of a scene. Can I have the next slide? In September 1923, Freud travels to Rome with Anna. It's his last journey to Rome, his seventh visit. He writes to Lou Andreas Salome, here I am again in Rome and I feel this will do me good. It's here I realize just what excellent company my little girl is. From Rome, on 16 September, Sigmund sends a postcard home, remarking that Anna is as gay as a chaffinch. There is little correspondence from this holiday, though a detailed list exists. Next slide, please. Compiled by both during their last three days. On their return from Rome, their Roman adventures, Anna rereads the notes. All that they experienced there 
comes to life again. She seeks to record a part of the memory, to remember better. She notes down the journey from Florence to Rome on the 1st of September, hot and uncomfortable, too many noisy Americans from Cincinnati who take her father and her for Italians, wives who demand information about Roman pearls, and I've cut out a large section about the train journey. 30 minutes before arrival, her father points out the Dome of St. Peter's, and at midday they arrive at Rome and take, are taken to their hotel, the Hotel Eden, which you've just seen, by the hotel's omnibus. It's hard to see anything from the bus, but her papa shows her the baths of Diocletian, and they're given... On arrival at the hotel, they're given two comfortable rooms with a huge bathroom, numbers 119 and 120. The windows giving out onto the Via de Porto Pinciano. At first, they fear the southwest aspect will make their rooms too hot and wonder if they should change them, but their fears are groundless. Except to protect the rooms from the sun, they never have to draw the curtains, for they're not overlooked. In front of the window of her papa's room is a line of particularly pointed cypress trees solemnly nodding their heads in the light current of air as they did in 1913, says her father. They rearrange the furniture, turning a marble top washstand into a games table. Her papa's desk has to be protected from the wind. Anna and her father follow a dense program of promenades some taken on foot and others by car from the Hotel Eden. They visit many places, and because I have photographs, I like to think they include um, the views which I have shown. Can we have the last, what I think is the last slide, if I've planned this correctly? And I'm nearly ended because I can see Lucy looking anxious there, but it's okay, I've nearly done. But I did see you do that sort of nervous gesture. And the way, I didn't like the way you were doing the throat cutting thing. Nick, can I have the last slide, please? Thank you. One evening, Anna and Sigmund go to the cinema, or at least an excursion to the cinema that evening is noted. Perhaps some historians of Freud think Freud remained at the Hotel Eden while Anna goes to a flick with the daughter of a shareholder of the hotel. For us, there is a letter of the same day written to the family back at home that Anna is going out with the girl, but that might be during the day. In 1923 in Rome, the Italian films that they might have seen include, and forgive my accent, Lucia, I might get you up to do this, but Amorte, Signor Ladro, which I think means to death, Mr. Thief, thief yes? But I think that film was not actually released until December of that year. Or La Dame de Chez Maxime, which I think is after a farce by Fedo. Or Ali Spezzate, Broken Wings. Thank you. You see, you see. <laughs> they might have seen, however, The Ten Commandments, of course, uh, which Cecil B. DeMille's film released that year which tells the story of Moses leading the Jews from Egypt to the Promised Land. Or they could have seen The Eternal City, a film that is now lost, directed by George Fitzmaurice, in which this footage of King Victor, Victor Emmanuel III and Benito Mussolini reviewing Italian troops. Or they could have seen Salome, directed by Charles Bryant, in which Salome, the daughter of Herodias, seduces her stepfather, Herod, Governor of Judea, with a salacious dance. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for that really boring lecture of yours. <laughs> and um, I'm aware that we've run out of time and you've been sitting here for two hours seeing this incredible diversity of work. We've got one last impromptu performance by Annabel Nicholson, who we're very lucky to have down from Scotland um, today. I just wanted to, to say very briefly, it's been wonderful to do this, this artwork, if I can call it that, and thank you to everyone that's agreed to take part and to meet my, my challenge of 
a 30-second film loop. The idea of this was to be generative, and I feel that it has been generative um, for everybody in terms of the way perhaps it's made you think about the other aspects of your work, whether they might be text, poetry, or whether they might be films or painting. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you to the Camden Arts Centre for letting us do it. You're welcome. just written this today and it was prompted by something Lucy told me last week um, which came as quite a surprise um, that she told me that after this show all the loops of films are being given back to those of us who made them I think it's a very generous gesture but I'm concerned So I've written this. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> How's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Even at the back. She said they would be given back just as they had been brought together for this time. Now they would all go back. There was an openness about how she saw it, an awareness that things would or could go on in different ways. It's your film, she said. But is it? I wasn't sure. I felt it was part of something else. It belonged with the others. It was part of a whole. We were given a starting point. Mine wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been asked, been given that starting point. And even then, it might not have. I liked her idea about things being dispersed, in movement. There was a sense of possibilities as if giving back might allow something else to happen. But did they really come from each of us? Were they really ours? Or did they come from somewhere else? Did mine come from a sense of being included, being part of something more than me? And don't they all provide a space for each other, a means of saying something? And would be something be lost if they couldn't be seen again, together, at different times, in different spaces, reflecting off each other?
side with my new film, uh, particularly like the women who took part and showed their view to film to, to help on. But there's enough for everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm sorry it's a little bit late, but if you could start making way downstairs, that'd be great. I'd also like to say thank you to Lucy and to all of the performance that have um, happened this evening. No. You can do it if you want it. I mean, they're, they're, the crowd, they're mad for it. They're, It's short, but it's actually, again, it's not me. It's a participation piece. Um, so I need to hand up things for... I need volu 14 volunteers to read, to read a short piece. And maybe you're all a bit too exhausted. I can see you looking weary in the front there, Jonathan. Okay.
Queenie shares this box. She just takes hold of the bars and shakes them hard. And she is all the time trying to climb through. But nobody could climb through that pattern. It strangles so. I think that it's why it has so many heads. So they say yes, hence what they are ready. They say that the breast, the curved eyelashes, the flat or wooden hips, they say that the bulging or hollow bellies, they say that the bulbs are henceforth in movement. They say that they are inventing a new dynamic. They say they are throwing off their sheets. They say they are getting down from their beds. They say they are leaving the museums, the showcases, the pedestals where they have been installed. They say they are quite astonished that they can move. So thank you. That on. Yes, dear. thank you, Lucy. Thank you all again for coming. Sally, Talia Riley, who's over there, <laughs> jumping out at people nightly. <laughs> um, yes, thank you all for coming. Um, check out our Big Bamboozle fundraiser for the residency program here, which is happening on the 16th of March. Love you all to come. It'll be lots of fun. And thanks for coming. And please make your way out quietly.